Hi, everyone. We're so, so happy that you're all here in big numbers. I know how, how much it took for you guys to be here. It's a Friday, it's lunchtime, and you know what? We're so appreciative of this, but we need to stick together, our science people. So um, for people who don't know me, I'm Micheline Amar. I'm, um, I work for Electric Shock in, uh, I guess, a curriculum consultant, some sort of nice fancy title for just being a teacher, okay? And um, we're here uh, with Helen. Helen, I'll let you introduce yourself. So uh, I think a, a lot of you know me, but yeah, I'm a science teacher over at, uh, in the Riverside School Board. Um, in the Riverside School Board and I also do union stuff. So like I said, a lot of you know me already. <laughs> so we have the package, great. So um, based, uh, based on last, the meeting we we found that uh, well a lot of a lot of requests came in that you guys wanted to talk about um like um the 40 the, the 40 59 and the 40 60 to follow this discussion i know some of you had asked uh, for what about the theoretical part we didn't forget about that we're going to come back to it it's just we put um we we underline the the um the practical part first because some centers needs to be just uh, prepared for that we were so lucky to have uh, Jessica Turgeon, who's a teacher from at RSP uh, <laughs> School Board, uh, to share with us um, to share with us uh, her experience in the forty sixty. Okay, so Jessica, it's all yours. <laughs> um, okay, so hi everyone. It's a pleasure to meet to meet you all. Um, so I'm also a teacher with Riverside School Board. I, I teach at Access Cleghorn Adult Education Center with Helen. Um, I teach the 4060 course, and I also teach the uh, the, high, the environmental science, so TSC 4063 and 64. Um, I've only taught the 4060 once. I taught it last semester, and I'm currently teaching it right now. Um, but uh, basically, what I I did for the 4060 is that since I did teach the since I teach the 63, I took a lot of uh, material from there and adapted it for the 4060 and I, that, that has really been helpful. Um, I've shared a lot of my resources with Micheline. Micheline, you got my email with the Google Drive. Yes. So I've shared a lot of my resources with Micheline. So I give you permission to share with everyone here. I don't mind at all. Um, these are just some um, resources that I took from my 63 and I adapted for 4060. I also have pretests in there as well. Um, and so I guess I was thinking this could be more of like a QA. and uh, a I, I really enjoy teaching this course. Um, and I think that it has such a potential to be such a fun course for the students. Um, it could be kind of scary at the beginning because there's a, uh, the technology is um, different if you know, you're working like with woodworking, um, but it can be super fun. Well, my question to Jessica, like I was like when I asked her to come like to share this is because she, like you said, it's because she taught 63 and 60 and to see like there is and she's also like she's on the team of actually creating the, the 4060 exam. So we're in a team. There's a new version, hopefully that we sent off to BIM and hopefully it'll go through nicely. And hopefully, since Barbara's here, maybe we'll push her to get us ready that for September for everybody to access, which is like, you know, a wonderful, wonderful version. But it, it like, again, on the team, we were like many teachers and we had also Francois who already, you know, worked uh, on, on other versions. So we had a lot of people participating and revising and validating this exam. And what's interesting, it will be also um, tested <laughs> so and and adjust it so hopefully and it doesn't look nothing like the prototype you know, a common question for a lot of teachers is um so what parts of the labs like what equipment did you need to complete the course like really nuts and bolts like what equipment was the bare minimum you found how many lab activities did you find was the minimum to really prep them for the exam and where did you find the students had um like hiccups, what did they have the, did it take the most time for like a student to grasp if they never handled the tool? Uh, sure, yeah, I can definitely talk about the labs. Um, so uh, first question <laughs> first question was uh, the tools, yes. Um, so bare, bare minimum, you would need hand drills. 
uh, you would need hand saws. That is the absolute bare minimum and everything that goes with that. So clamps, um, workstation boards that you can put on the desk. Um, I'm trying to think of what else the students use. Uh, we use our saws with miter boxes. So that would be the bare, bare minimum. So electric hand drills um, and hand saws. Our, um, our center is lucky. We have a really amazing lab tech. Uh, we have electric, so we have a, a, a drill press, which I haven't used with the students yet. Um, and we have an electric saw, uh, which is the same thing. We, I have not used that with the students yet because we don't need those on the exam. Um, but the bare minimum you need is the hand saws and the hand drills. Um, so all of my activities, all of my lab activities deal with hand drills um, and a few of them deal with the saws as well. So they give them practice. Um, as for the lab activities, I can share my lab activities and these have worked really well with both my 60 group and my 63 group. I always start with a, a lab activity where... Yeah, um, and, and it, sorry to interrupt you, just to let, you, to, to let everybody know, I will be posting all her drive on the age resources, like Helen's also the stuff they're there, but they're under pretest and teacher contribution. Just because there's pretest and stuff, so I did not want to distribute it everywhere. So we kept it on the pre under pretest with a password, but there's a teacher contribution folder. Okay. So when you go there, you'll have access to all their courses, to Helen's courses, the 59 and Jessica's uh, everything that she gave. So just to give you, I know some people ask me, where are they? So that's where they are located. And I'll, I'll show you after. Okay, so this is the first lab that we do together is the desktop organizer. Um, and so I'm a big fan of ill-structured labs. Uh, my classes are three hours. And so I always, I give them a model and I say, you know, this is the model. These are the rules that you have to follow. So, you know, you want to make a container that's this big, one that's in the shape of a rectangle, etc. cetera. Um, and then they go for it. So this was the first lab that we did is build a desktop organizer. Um, this uses no wood or uh, hand drills or saws. It's made of a foam board that you can buy at the dollar store. And this is the first, first lab that we do. It gets them to practice their drawings. So it gets them to practice their multi-view, their oblique, um, and to get them used to writing a procedure and uh, answering like a lab report. Uh, the students absolutely love this lab because they do have the freedom to make a desk organizer however they choose, as long as it follows these rules that I give them. So I always give them, you know, they have to make four compartments. One has to blah, blah, blah. Um, so it just gets them in, in this in this mindset. And this is always my first lab and it always goes super well. Um, and then I do uh, this lab where I have them build a planter and a clipboard. And this is where I introduce them to using the tools. Um, so the, here they're using the drill and uh, they're using the saw. Uh, and the clipboard is a very simple uh, lab where they're just drilling a, a screw in and they're making one hole. So it's very simple and it's, then the planter is a little bit like a step up. Uh, and again, I do this in three hours and they have the whole three hours to, to build these two things. And so it just, it gets progressively harder. Uh, so we start with the, with the organizer, which is just practicing the drawings. Then we get to the clipboard, which is the first time they use the tools. And it's a simple object to make. And then we go up to the planter, which is a little bit more difficult. Um, there's one more lab that I can't find right now that I do in between, which is they make an elastic car. So it's made out of junk material, like bottle caps, uh, extra syringes, whatever we have laying around the lab. And they have to make a, a little car that can work on an elastic band mechanism. So you wind up the wheels with the elastic band and then it makes the car move. Um, so this has no tools, but it it's, again, it's for the drawing and for the, um, mechanical engineering part of the course. So the rotation and the tension and all that stuff. Uh, and then this is the last lab that they do. Whoops, sorry. This is the last lab that we do. We build a catapult. Um, so this is, uh, we actually did this last week with my students, with my 4060 group. Uh, so my wonderful lab tech built a catapult for us. And uh, so this is her model and I have the students build it. And um, so they have to cut, I don't know if you see my mouse, that they have to cut so that these two side pieces is one piece, 
they have to saw it in half. Uh, they need to make the holes that go through here to put the dowel through, and they have to do the holes as well at the bottom to put the dowel through. Um, and then we have an elastic band that goes in the back. And then this catapult is a really, really good catapult. It, it shoots a ping pong ball like three meters. Um, so this is, I, I like to do four or five lab activities. And by the end, they will have seen uh, an elastic band mechanism twice. Uh, I do a pretest as well that's similar. Um, so um, yeah, so these are the lab activities that I do. Um, I would say I would say you would need like four lab activities, um, just because there's some students that have never used the drill before, and it can be scary. It can be scary at first because it's loud and it's powerful. Um, so giving them four instances to practice with it um, has worked with me. Has worked really well with me with my forty sixty group and my forty sixty three group. Um, so that was that was the second question, Helen. Uh, and then, right, so how many lab activities? Um, obviously, the more the better, the more the better, but I, I've, I've had good success with my 60 and my 63 groups with these activities. Um, and yeah, my students usually do, very, they generally do quite well on the practical. Um, so and then, well, I can't remember there, the last question. My last question was, are there specific areas where you see um, because you have done it twice now where you yes. consistently have students that need more time. Like, is there a specific skill or a specific piece of equipment or like how many, like you've been talking about the projections, like how many hours does it take to get them at those, to be doing those projections to the right sort of level? Mm -hmm. like, um, so I would definitely say that the most difficult parts of the lab of the practical would be the drawings and the projections. The students have uh, a hard time uh, remembering what goes into the projections. Like uh, you need to write the dimensions, you need to put the scale. Um, and so I would say that is, the, that is the most challenging part. I spend, so we spend two classes, so that's six hours where we just practice projections. I have them building objects with Legos and I have them doing the, the projections of each side and practicing, um, but even, uh, that's the, because that's all the time that I have is that I have two classes to do this. Um, and so when they do these labs, they get to practice their projections as well. But that is definitely the part that I, I've noticed that my students struggle in. So not only the 60, but the 63 as well. Most of them pick up the hand drill really quickly. Um, the saws, the saws as well, I, have, I did not see any problem with the saws this, this semester, at least with my group. Um, I think I, per, it, from my experience with these courses, the students pick up the hands, like the hands-on part of the practical really quickly. It's more of the abstract um, theoretical part, which would be the drawings and the scale and all that stuff that they have trouble with. But the actual, you know, coming up with ideas of how am I going to build this? Okay, like I'm going to do this first and that second. The students are really good at that. They're really good at, okay, I have three hours to build this thing. They're really good at problem solving in that sense. And and because it's kind of fun. It's kind of fun to, to build stuff. Um, but the, yeah, the, I, I would definitely say 100% would be the drawings. Uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, I have two questions, actually. So the first one, thanks, just for that, Jessica. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to know uh, administratively how you offer this course, because I think when Helen, you presented, you offer 59 and 62 concurrently, right? So I wanted to know how do you offer uh, 60 is my first question. Okay, uh, so 60 right now is offered once a week for the entirety of the semester. Okay, so, so it's, just on, it's on, on its own. Yeah. It's completely on its own once a week from January until June. Okay. Um, yeah, that's how it is right now. We have, I don't know if, if the scheduling has been confirmed, Helen, that we're going to merge the 60 and the 59 as one, as like the secondary three. But as of right now, it's just once a week, January to June by itself. Uh, three hours a week. So it's one class a week, three hours to Gail who asked in the, in the chat. Um, my second question is, you know, you, you, I just like was texting Leticia who's on here too, you know, about the, the projections and, and it's a, it's in math three, right. That they, that they do that. Um, so 
do you have a prereq for this science, for your science courses, a math prereq for your students? Like, do they have to complete a certain level of math before they can take science? I don't believe so. Um, I, I think Helen would be a better person to ask for this, but I don't believe so. Um, generally, unless it's a strict, like, we can't enter the marks into JAD until this other course is done, then it's not enforced. Yeah, it's because, not yeah the because of numbers and, and needing funding and all that jazz, like it's it's so uh, I mean I don't judging from most of the students that I've seen take the 60, most of them have passed are in the secondary four um, are in the secondary four mass. But I mean, I let's face it, we all know that at, at adult ed, just somebody having completed secondary three math, especially if it was in the youth sector three years ago, like. True. But Sheila, just to add to what Helen said, this is a technically, it's a 40, 60, so it's a level four. It's a level four course that has been taught in three, really. So technically, if the student happens to be taking math, three while taking this course is beneficial because what he could do a link between like, what's the point of doing that in math, that concept in math in level three, where, where do I need this pers perspective? You know, mm -hmm. then it will be combined to this course. Like you could link it to this course or even this could inspire the math teachers in, in that class, in that math class teaching perspective to actually bring in like- Yeah, that's a good point, you know? that's a good point. I mean. In our discussions at PAC, what we're thinking is that, you know, you're going to have to have at least a grade eight, the grade eight math to do the 40, 59, and the 60, because these are technically grade nine new sector courses. So have your grade eight math before you start. Hopefully you're doing grade nine math at the same time, or you passed it, uh, you know. I was also going to say, what I know of the grade nine math, um, at least our teacher's assessment is the the system of equation work that they have to do is so heavy that that's where they they have to focus their time right yeah and yeah. so like technical drawing is one of the ones where like it it's not it's heavily yeah. weighted so like yeah because like i just for anybody who does, I, I assume everyone here realizes but at least in our center the judgment has been that quite a bit of the work in the secondary nine mass course is more difficult than the grade 10 mass in terms of the systems work and like the uh, the finding solutions and stuff like that. So, yeah. yeah. And yeah, like uh, the camera was mentioning, he said most of mine haven't passed math three. They usually have sec two math. Some students struggle with proportion calculation and scale and stuff, yeah. Well, to, just to let you know, proportion scales and, and those basic concepts, they have trouble with all the way to five. So yeah, it seems to be a common issue across the board. <laughs> yeah. So, but, but just as an idea, because like you're absolutely right, if the teacher happened to have more time to teach it, and I know it's part of the Sec 3 math curriculum, the perspective, it will be nice to kind of link it to that. So at least they see it maybe a couple of times before, but if not, you know, you have to put your, you know, yeah. Micheline, that would be a great document to have. I mean, maybe it exists already, all of these, you know, so I can give the math teacher, look at all these things that they're doing in science so that you should do this and give the science teacher, look at all these things. I'm sure it exists. I'm sure you've already made this magic, so. Well, <laughs> I was gonna say there's definitely, there's definitely an advantage to having the science guys talk to the math guys if they're not the same person, because I know I finally talked our grade, um, our our grade advanced grade 10 math teacher to stop using round numbers and to start using decimals <laughs> because they always have avoided decimals right and like ugly like 3.25 x and I was like you're killing me when they get to physics it's over <laughs> right and like using 10 for gravity in their examples and just being like no <laughs> But, but you know, it's all about training, right? And if we, if again, I love the idea, if the math and the science teacher, they talk, you know, then it becomes more beneficial because there's so much in math, like a lot of, actually, I just, I just been to a workshop recently and they're saying that how math is still difficult among adults and actually the second cycle of, of, of high school because the students do not connect what they're learning in their math class 
to anything else relevant to them. And sometimes context plays a big role. So if, and the fact that also every kid is exposed to different things, right? But bringing the reality into, well, okay, all you needed is for this course, and this is how it's applied in this course, since we know that science is more like you have to take real life situation to kind of apply. So maybe bring in that connection to math too. I don't know. But you're right, Sheila, that could be a document that could be worked on uh, among levels. Yeah. But you, Jessica, just out of curiosity, uh, did you find that your students had difficulties in math? Is, is that somewhere that you, you, you know? Um, it really, it depended on, this, on the students. In general, in general, it wasn't that it wasn't bad. Um, the students were uh, okay. They were okay with the scale. I don't know if it was the way I explained it, or I, because I don't know. I don't know what they learned in their math three, um, but generally they were okay with with that math that's in the forty sixty course. Because the only math really in the forty sixty course is the scale. Um, you're, you're you're either dividing all your measurements by two if you're if you're halving it or timesing it by two, um, and that they understood like oh okay it's too big I'll divide everything by two that they understood. Um, it's just if I were to give them a scale on an object on a diagram they might not like it might it, you know they they don't have to do the calculations but they see a one to two and then I'm not sure which one is the drawing if the drawing's bigger or smaller. Um, but the actual calculation, they seem to be okay. And that's how it was last semester. And that's how it is this semester as well. Um, but yeah, I, I would, yeah, I would say the most, most of the difficulty would be if you already give them a diagram and you, the scale is already given to them. Um, they're unsure of, is the drawing bigger or smaller than the real life? Because they, they themselves did not do the scale. Um, that's what I've noticed last semester and this semester. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, like if they choose, a, if they want a half, if they want to make their drawing half as big, um, they're all fine with just dividing all the measurements by two. They're okay with that. Um, but it, yeah, once given, they're, they're, it, it confuses them a little bit. That's mm -hmm. what I've noticed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's almost, and it, it's, it's similar for the 4063 as well. It's similar for the 4063 as well. Doing their actual drawings, the students are super good with that, um, with the scale, making their own scale, but interpreting is a little bit difficult. Yeah. Did you um, review some scales? Like, did you give them a bit of a math review before or did you just start it in the topics, teaching the topics? So, so I gave them a bit of a, of a review and we did a, a, quite a few together. Um, what I think it is, is that they just forget the order. If it's a one to two versus a two to one, um, they just forget the order of which one is the drawing and which one is the real life. Um, because yeah, when they see a one to two, they know that one of the things is twice as big, but they just can't remember which one is twice as big. Um, same thing with the two to one. They know that one of them is twice as big, but they're not sure which one, um, which yeah, because, because there is an order in that ratio. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's, I do that with them. I, I do that with them as well. So I've always, I, I do the ruler two dots colon real life. Um, I do that as well. I do that as well. And uh, yeah, it's in it's in the slides, it's in their notes. But um, I, yeah, we all know how it is. So out of curiosity, um, if the scale drawings are like the toughest part, including on the lab, Roughly how many examples, do you know, have an idea of how many examples it takes the average student to get up to like a pass level? Like, do they need to do five? Do they need to do six? No, obviously, I know it varies, obviously, depending on the students, some will walk in and, you know, do it perfectly. Mm -hmm. But do you have an idea, do you have like um, a rough idea of sort of like, just so like would, if people are looking for like, how many examples do I need to prep, like in terms of worksheets and stuff? Yeah. I, I would say I would say between five and ten. Usually, usually by then they kind of grasp on. But it also depends, and this is something that I had brought up. My class is once a week for three hours. So by the time we get to, you know, we have classes on Thursdays. By the time next Thursday comes around, the students haven't looked at their science notes in a week, and they just they forget because it's just been so long since we've had a class. Um, 
And so they, yeah, they really do need that repetition. Um, at the beginning, when we start the lab activities, um, they have a hard time as we go along and we usually do four or five lab activities. They usually get them, like they get the scale by that point. Um, but, um, but yeah, I would say between five, between five and 10, we do, we do four together. And then I have them practice a few by themselves and then they do it on their lab activities. Um, and, you know, when they're in class doing them, they're fine. But then a week goes by, we come back and they may have forgotten because, because it's been a week since they've looked at it. Um, but if we were doing them together in the class, I would say between five and 10. Yeah, because once you get it, once you get it, um, at least if you're in the one class and you're not waiting a week, it, once you get it, you, you kind of get it. Um, you might lose it after a week, but um, but yeah, they're all solved in the same way. They're all solved in the same way. Mm. Yeah. Question for you, Jessica. If let's say I, I I if let's say I'm a new teacher wants to implement this, let's say next semester, what yeah. things could I like kind of start? Where do I start? What do I do? <laughs> uh, that's a big that's a big question. Um, I had, so I had a, a big helping hand from Sonia, Sonia Fioco. Um, she provided me with um, uh, quite a few resources from the youth sector, uh, a curriculum map. Um, and so I used, I used that. Um, so I used that to organize myself. Uh, I, I modified some of those resources to make them more appropriate for adult uh, education. Um, I also took a lot of material from my 4063. So that's kind of that's kind of cheating, I guess. Uh, if if you don't teach forty sixty three, but I already had the material, and they overlap so much that you know, um, I have one student who's in both of those classes, and and you know he comes to class and he's like, oh miss, we did this like last month already. I'm like, I I know, I know, but um, like yeah, because the courses overlap so much. So um, I was really lucky in that sense that I had a, an amazing ped consultant who provided me with the resources. And the help, and then I also had resources from 4063. Um, but uh, what I did with these two resources is that I went through the DED um, and I made a checklist for the students of the main topics. So I had a checklist of, you know, these are the topics you need to study, and I and I I sent that to you as well, Michelin. Um, is that I, I separated it into the chapters and the topics that you need from each chapter. And then I built my course from, from there. So it's a, it's a linear, it's a linear course. Um, and some of the topics relate to each other. And I have those relations in the, in my presentations and in my uh, activities in class. Um, but yeah, I use those, I use those resources to make that checklist. And then I combined everything. So, uh, I guess my suggestion for a, a brand new teacher teaching this course um, would be to try and pull resources from teachers who have previously taught this or taught 4063 um, because it really does overlap so much. Um, and a lot of my activities I do from the 4063. Um, so, so yeah, talk to your ped consultant and and if you teach 63, use those resources. And if you don't, ask the teacher who does because it saves it, it saved me a lot of time. There was only a couple things that were different that I had to do on my own, like the musculoskeletal system that that I was is not in 63, uh, but the rest pretty much is. And so we do the same activities. Um, honestly, we do the same activities. So by the time the students get to the exam, um, the exam is easier than what they would have done in class, um, at least for the theory. The practical last semester was, was quite difficult, but the theory, they, they all did really well on. Um, but yeah, uh, as for uh, in the chat, yes, so I, I've shared my lab activities with Michelin and Michelin will share them. Yeah. Um, so yeah, you can use them, modify them to your liking. Um, they've worked really well with my 63 group and my 60 group. Uh, you might have to modify them a little bit for the 60 um, because uh, on the exam, the students 
at least for the labs, the students don't have to do the design plan plus the oblique projection plus the multi view, but in 4063, they do. Um, and so uh, I just keep it the same. So the students in 60, 4060 have to do it as well. So by the time they get to the exam, they're like, oh, I don't have to do the design plan. I don't have to do this. Okay, nice. Um, so you can modify it if you'd like. Um, I keep it the same. I keep it the same so that the students are over prepared. Um, so yeah, you can definitely use them, modify them to your liking. Don't use them. How much hands-on, uh, like hands-on teacher uh, help do your, do you find students need in the lab activities? Like, could you, would they work in an individualized setting or are they need a little more teacher guidance? So, um, so I'm, so like I said, I really do enjoy ill-structured activities. I really do enjoy those because they're adults and they have three hours to, you know, they ha I give them that flexibility. Um, but I always, always start, uh, I always start with uh, how to use the tools. Um, I give them a demonstration at the beginning of each time we do a lab activity. So the first, the first lab activity that I do that involves the tools is the clipboard. So I'll spend 20 minutes. Okay, everyone come around, watch me do this. This is how you do it. These are the protocols. These are the safety rules for using the drill. And then um, that first class, when they're ready to make their hole or screw in a screw, they call me over and I wash them and I make sure they do it safely. And once I've approved that they can do it safely, then they're on, then they're on their way. Um, then the next class, I do the planter, for example, or the clipboard, uh, not, sorry, not the clipboard, or the catapult or whatever. Um, I'll give a refresher, but it's much shorter. So a five, 10 minute refresher, this is how you use the hand drill. If you, you, if you, uh, so they all would have gotten approved by me by that point. But um, if you're uncomfortable, I, have me come over again. Um, so that first class usually takes a bit longer because I need to go around and approve everyone. They need to show me their technique, make sure they're doing it safely. Um, but after that, it's just these quick little refreshers. Um, so by the time we get to the exam, the students are good, at least for using the, the, the tools. Um, and then I do the same thing with the saw. When I do the same thing with the saw. Here's how you use a saw. These are the safety protocols. When you're ready to saw, call me over. I need to approve it. Um, and then I let them, then I let them on their way. So this, this system has worked in an, in an individualized setting. Um, this could be even easier because if you have five students, you know, you, it's less time doing this approval. Um, but, uh, but yeah, this has worked with my groups of, with my groups of like 20, 20 plus students um, because they all work at different paces. So I can go around, like, it's not, it's not like I have 10 students at once saying, miss, can you approve me? It's, it, it has worked well. It has worked well in the past few semesters. Yeah. Jessica, just out of curiosity, I know, did you have a choice in what drill do you use versus, like, I know some, some teachers were complaining that the students find it heavy. Is there, like, did, did you pick your drills based also? Uh, okay, yeah, so, so when I came into the center, when I was first hired at the center, uh, we already had uh, six pairs of hand drills. Um, I, I like them. I liked them really, I, I liked them a lot. They were light, they were easy to use. There were two separate drills, one for drill bits, one for driver bits. So it made it really simple for the students. So like, okay, the silver one is for driver, the black one is for drill. Um, and so we bought, we just bought new ones. We just bought more. Um, and uh, yeah, my lab tech was the one who bought them. And she asked me, do you want more? Do you like these? And I said, I, I like these, let's buy more of these. And that is all I really know about the purchasing of these of these hand drills. Mm -hmm. um, I can ask her to to give me the link of where she bought them. I think she bought them at Home Depot. Um, but uh, but uh, I like them, and so my lab tech bought more. Uh, so yeah. Just out of curiosity, the saw and the meter. I know some people like were mentioning that some were heavy the saw versus others. I don't know how does that work if everybody. Have an opinion on that too. 
I mean, so so again, so again, my lab tech, we already had one, we had one saw. We had one saw and uh, again, I liked it. It was good. Uh, the handle wasn't too heavy. And so same, same, same thing as the drills. I asked if we can buy more because we're for a class of 20, we can't have 20 people sharing one saw. Um, and so she bought the exact same ones uh, for the miter and the, for the miter boxes and the saws. I don't know how it would be if you would like, want different. I was different gonna say, tools. Yeah. you would also wanna keep in mind though, the lighter your drill is, the more you have to apply the force, right? So like yeah. having a really light drill means that you have to start pushing in harder. So uh, if you're not familiar, I, I'm not an expert at power tools, but I do know that like it might, it does, yeah, it sucks. You're like, this is heavy, but you know, once you put it up and pull it on that weight, you're not trying to hold it back. That weight is there to help push it in. So that might be a thing to remember and, and, and inform students. Mm -hmm. um, same thing with the saw, right? The more, if it's a very, very light saw, it's going to tend to skip over the top of the wood much more than actually do. And then now you're going to have to start actually push, applying more force from your arm. Um, so there is a trade-off with having a lighter tool doesn't necessarily make the job more comfortable or actually easier at the end of the day. Yeah, so, so there's definitely pros and cons for each type of tool. Um, I decided to stick with the same drills because I, that's what was there when I, when I, when I started working. Um, and as for the saws, we're cutting pieces of wood that are like an inch thick, not even. Um, so, didn't matter. so yeah, it didn't really, it didn't, yeah, it's, they still cut fine. Um, but, uh, but yeah, a hundred percent for the, for the drills, the heavier there are, the less you have to push down. Um, these are like battery. So these are battery operated hand drills. So they're wireless. Uh, you just have to charge the battery. Um, and they, they get the job done. Um, I have the students with their non-dominant hand hold the back just to stabilize it. And so um, if like they can, they use that to push down if they need to, but, uh, but otherwise, I've, yeah, there's been no problems with, with these drills. Our, our lab tech has her own, like she has a pair of personal hand drills that are the same brand that she, and she brings them in whenever we have a lab. Yeah. yeah. And Michelin, you, you, you know how amazing our lab tech is. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> I'm all, I give her five stars. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I'm just saying for, for the people who are just starting like to, to, to buy mm -hmm. tools and stuff, just to keep all of these things in mind. And maybe if you have already a list of tools that you tried and it worked nicely, maybe we could get the link or just so they could have a picture of what to expect. Because again, we have teachers of all over the province and some they're doing many courses at once and they probably have just a corner in a classroom to do these labs, right? So mm -hmm. they don't know what to buy. And uh, since you used some and you tested them and it worked nicely with your students, it's nice to maybe just uh, to give them a guidance, but it doesn't mean they have to buy it, but just to have an, uh, you know, an idea. So, so yeah, so like I said, I've only used, I've only used one type of like one brand of drill that's the, it's the only one I've used so I don't have any comparison to anything else my drill at home is uh wired like you have to plug it in so it's it's very powerful it's very different it's very heavy um so this these are the only ones that I've used in the class setting so I I can suggest this one but I don't have anything to compare it to absolutely uh, I think Sheila had a question for you um kind of related uh, a little bit. I just wanted to know your lab tech, your wonderful lab tech. So she is supporting you in the 59, 60, 61, 62, 63, 64 chemistry and physics. Yes. And, and it's manageable and okay. Uh, so if I understand correctly, uh, Helen, she doesn't, I mean, so the 4061 is just the breadboard. So there's not no setup there. Uh, physics, you set that up. If I'm, yeah, if I'm, the physics yeah. are a dry lab. So like, yeah, she she organized me at the beginning, being like, "Here's your little thing of lenses. Here's your thing of this. Here's your thing of that." Um, but then I put together kits, and I'm like, "Here, kids. Here's your box for optics. Here's your box for kinematics." Mm -hmm. So that that's a uh, the physics very much is a uh, you can set your kits up. Nothing can go bad as long as you don't put batteries in, um, and then it takes care of themselves. And the students, I also make the students clean up. Um, 
uh, because especially seeing as that's found its way onto the rubrics, I'm like, I put out my basket, like, okay, gang, if we're, if it's, we're disassembling the kits for some reason, I'm like, okay, here's where you put your plane mirrors, here's your here, here's your thing, here's your here, you got to put all of it away. Um, so for the physics, I mean, it's really only 10 minutes set up, 10 minutes clean takedown. So I do that generally. Um, I most of the courses that I've worked with, I have always built that way. So even the 4062 and the 4059, I really did try to build as like, once you've collected your glassware together um, and you've given them some salt, there's a real minimal, only like two or three labs actually have, you have to swap out chemicals for. Everything else is like a water and salt lab. So once again, you can put a kit together of the glassware and then that is their kit. Um, and what I do then is I, they get all of, I usually start the kits the first week with some of the equipment. And then every week I add more equipment and I never take equipment out. So by the time we get to the exam and they have to choose the appropriate equipment, I'm just giving them this basket full of all the stuff they've seen all semester. Right. And so they have all of the lab's equipment presented to them for the exam. And it means I don't have to do a ton of setup. Gail isn't breaking down my labs every week. Like, right, they sit in baskets in a corner of the classroom, ready to go to, so like, we have done a few things to minimize the amount of prep. There's no way around the large amount of prep for the 4060 because of the, uh, the pieces of wood and the, and the chemistry because of all the little things that have to go out. So we've, as a center, we've really worked to minimize the prep in other, in the course codes where we can. If I can, if I can add, um, if I can add, I've adopted this system as well, where I have the little baskets. Um, so I did the same thing this semester, Helen, with the with your courses. That I've kept those, I've kept those baskets for the students. Um, so they just find their name on the basket, and like that's their basket. Um, for the forty sixty and the forty sixty three. Uh, so Gail is our lab tech. She she's the one that sets it all up. So because of the wood and because of the, the material that the equipment that's used. Uh, however, I've gotten the students, they clean up, they clean up the 4060 and the 4063. So they put away the clamps, they put away the board, they put away the drills, they put away everything that they possibly can. All the drawers are labeled um, so that when, so there's no cleanup for Gail for the lab tech at all. She just has to take care of the scrap wood. Um, but all of the other equipment, I make the students put that as part of their cleanup routine. Um, so the only, I would say, so the 4064, uh, that one is, that one has a prep and cleanup for the lab tech chemistry as well. But um, Helen, so, so the 4059 uh, and the 62, uh, we have that system with the little baskets. And then the 60 and the 63, so the workshop labs, um, Gail just has to set it up, but the students break it, they clean it up. Um, yeah, and like I said, sorry, and I forgot to mention the yeah. 4061, which Jessica's also taken over for me this semester. But yeah, we just, we have um, little Tupperwares with a little, little breadboard in there and all the wires and the lights and it's a kit and then we've got a little push. They have all the little buttons and switches they need and it's in there as a complete kit there's enough in there to do every version of the lab and every single lab. So they get given that on mm -hmm. day one, mm -hmm. they get their kit and I teach, we go through and we teach them stage by stage. Like this is how you do the button and blah, 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 whatever. But they always have that whole kit there. They always have all of the material so that once again, so when they get to the exam, it's just a, here's your kit gang. I hope you didn't lose anything over the course of the semester. Micheline, I don't know if maybe I'm the only one who who has these this this concern. I don't know if it's within your mandate, but it would be might might be interesting to do a a lab tech workshop, you know, with absolutely. people who have absolutely. got some best practices because it's uh, yeah, absolutely, it's a absolutely. lot. We're going to be doing the 59 and the 60, and and already my lab tech is like yeah. But you know, this is this is what's interesting, like to hear from all kind of centers because every center has a different reality. Some centers don't even have a lab tech. You know what I mean? And and I know a lot of the teachers who are on their own, they go to this methodology, having labs done in like like containers. And if they have one or they have 10 students, they just pick a container and they let them use right. it. I always thought it was as an individualized center that would be you know necessary, but I'm not individualized, but I see that that's necessary for us too, you know? So 
I think we got to look at our practices. Absolutely. It, just, it makes it so much faster and easier. Um, it makes it so that there's less remembering, especially because like I said, like when I do 4062, right, they get the basket with the name on and um, I used to just add the stuff they needed that week, right? And then because it never came out, I never had to remember to put like, stirring rods back in they all had their you know and also there was the same way I was always less like listen guys if you're missing something you ask me I go get it for you and I hand it to you you want an extra beaker you think I didn't give you enough beakers well you ask me and we go get it and we give you a beaker and now you have an extra beaker in your thing okay so like it and so the, yeah we definitely we tried to minimize the cleaning of all the equipment and putting it away um we are lucky that our our admin we always roll around to june and they're always like hey cool we had like these two budgets that we didn't finish spending all the money on what do you want and then we're like glassware we want glassware <laughs> so we, we every june we stock up on our glassware um so that we can run our courses without having to put everything away every time and clean everything for every lab um, because that does get it gets too much well you know what it could be it could be wonderful that maybe if we could have a session maybe all the teachers like will come in with ideas so like that we'll we'll take that or maybe have a group of lab tech maybe join this discussion this discussion and hear the teachers needs and stuff and you know and and work together you know and I don't know. Yeah. Because I started when I first was hired at Access. Um, we had no, we only had individualized chemistry, we had and physics, and there were no lab techs. And I was responsible for ordering everything and doing everything myself. And that's why I've I flipped to this sort of like, even if I don't have kits, I need to have like little, I need to have the checklist, I need to have the equipment list for every lab split into like permanent, uh, like um lender equipment and consumables because like you're absolutely right it's a lot it's a lot to keep track of so definitely i'll keep in mind uh doing a, maybe a, la a lab tech sharing on suggestion for lab management maybe because they're sharing the same courses and maybe teacher could be invited to also in the, in the individual setting to so maybe I like going, yeah get i was going to say to answer lucam yeah actually it's um as long as the students know where to put things and that they're expected to do it, I have been surprised at how well, how good they are about it, right? Because even like for my physics group, like our meter sticks are kept in a very specific spot that's separate from everywhere else because all of our groups use the meter sticks. I mean, and I get the first group, the first day they're like, but where do I put this? And you're sort of like, where all the other meter sticks are? But they like, they pick up on it quick and they do actually really do start putting it away. Um, the one thing I do sometimes if there isn't a clear place, is I'll pull an extra, like if I have like beakers, graduated cylinders and stirring rods that I want them to want, rinse and then put, I'll put one on the back bench where they have to put it just so they all know that I should put my beakers here, I should put my stirring rods here and I should put my graduated cylinders here. Um, I did teach grade seven and eight for a couple years, <laughs> which is where I learned some of these tricks. <laughs> Honestly, um, we, we started with the sanitizing everything and we sort of, uh, at least myself, we've resorted a little bit to grocery store rules. Everyone sanitizes their hands when they come in. Uh, everybody sanitizes their house when they go out and they sanitize their benches and they do not assume uh, anything that they're working with is COVID safe. And they have to assume, I, and so no face touching, no leaving the lab until they've washed their hands. And that's really the only way we could work because we have about uh, the last couple of semesters, we've had groups of 30 odd students and we can't, we can't maintain this, this sanitize everything all the time. Um, they sanitize their desks and that's, that's what we had to do. We haven't had any breakouts. We haven't had, I don't think any of our science courses have actually been closed due to COVID. Um, cause let's face it, if you're touching lab equipment and then poking yourself in the face, we have much bigger problems than COVID. <laughs> oh, and just one other thing when we're talking about lab prep and so on, I have a pretty small group this semester, like eight students. And so I, a few of them joined me at lunch hour and we, 
we just sat up, you know, I say, okay, hey, can you put a balance on everyone's desk and a this and that? And then they get to know where everything is and, uh, and they are more familiar. So I found that to be helpful and eased my, cause I'm in a situation where I don't have a lab tech at my campus. So I'm kind of organizing the lab. So I found that to be really helpful and they love it because I don't know, they just they have something to do. So anyway, just a little thought. <laughs> Yeah, it's more responsibility. They'll feel they're part of the mm -hmm. process, you know. Mm -hmm. Do they clean up too, Susan? That's awesome. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah. Well, this is this is great. Again, just to remind everybody, if you don't mind, there's the uh, there's the um, the link that we gave everybody the form to fill up, please. So we could just make sure that if everybody's interested for another après cours for the, the end of this year for for, uh, for June. And if it is, what topic you would like to tackle? I know we still have theory component about the 59 and the 60 that we would look at. But uh, if there's other things also that you have in mind that you would like to share, discuss, difficulty, students' difficulty, we also have a new service this year that, um, that uh, I'm going to probably invite uh, the person to come in, which is what we call service complémentaire, which is also... Um, somebody who supports in learning difficulties. She's a specialist, uh, Karine Jacques. So she, we will be, I will be inviting her to come and, and maybe share difficult student situations in, in, in science. I know about reading strategies, about even like sometimes manipulation, manipulation, other setups that might facilitate everyone's life that she may have tricks on. So this is something I have in mind also. But if there's other things that you're the experts in your classroom. You live daily to daily. If there's anything that I could bring to uh, like ideas or anything that I could bring you to this, uh, to this meeting that could help you, please let me know and inspire me <laughs> because otherwise <laughs> I'll just have to go back to what I would have liked, you know, but uh, I mean, we all share the same concerns. We want the best for our students and we want to be the best for them too. So we have to take care of ourselves too. Right. So that being said, um, the resources will be up, up uh, today. I promise you. Um, if you have any questions, you know how to reach me and uh, please fill up that uh, survey. And the other thing is I would like to say thank you so, so much for Jessica for, for coming in. It takes, uh, she has no idea how much we appreciate it. Uh, and, uh, and please, um, please every, anyone and everyone who would like to also come and share, you're more than welcome. The floor is all yours. This is, this is for you, by you. <laughs> anyway, that's, that's for that. And of course, thanks to Helen, who's like uh, making, uh, making all the difference. <laughs> So, um, and for all of you teachers for, uh, and, and Barbara and, and uh, Richard for, for being there because otherwise this would not happen. So um, if I'll leave the floor to, to Jessica, if you have any questions, if you have anything, so I won't take more of your time that's already uh, uh, taken. Um, yeah, I just wanna say thank you for, uh, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to share my experiences with 4060. I hope, I hope you have a lot of fun teaching this course. I absolutely have had so much fun teaching this course. Um, the labs are amazing. The labs are so much fun. And then just to have a product at the end that the students have built, it's just, it's super rewarding um, for you and for the students. So I really hope, I hope this, um, uh, well, what, what, what are the words I'm trying to, I hope, I hope that doesn't scare you from the course and I hope you have a lot of fun with it. And if there's any questions, um, Michelin, you can share my email. I don't mind. You can always email me. Um, I will I will answer no problem. Um, anything to kind of share um, to share this course with people and make people like this course, basically. So yeah, I have no problem. You can share my email with everyone. And yeah, don't hesitate. Please don't hesitate um, to contact if you have any questions or if you. Um, need a resource and you or you need an activity and you're not sure maybe I've already done something similar and I can share with you um so yeah yeah but just to to just to add to what Bar uh, Barbara said and uh, I think Sarah and Jessica will support me on that is that right now this 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 exam is going to be tested right so and it's going to be uh, it's going to be student tested so we we're trying to change a bit the validation system you know so we're creating, we're validating by many people, and then we're testing it in, in classrooms. 
And then we're going to adapt the question based on the results we get from the students. And then that's going to go all to Barbara for her to adjust the questions if needs to be. So when you get to, you know, get to see it in, in September, you're going to have something that kind of not bad. <laughs> I'm not going to say perfect because nothing is perfect in life, but at least decent enough to be, uh, to be successful. Right. So, uh, yeah. That's, uh, and, and the other thing is maybe this is, uh, I don't know if Jessica maybe would be willing also, is we have also created a pretest, you know, she, you know uh, that she created a pretest. So we could maybe could go over the pretest and that, that pretest on its own should guide you on, let's say, uh, you know, pretests, right? It's not aim to do the exam, but it is, you know, to make sure that all the competency needed are there and, and the, all the techniques that's required for the students to, to be successful in is there. So, uh, so maybe this is something we could take a look at, maybe a pretest. That's the closest yeah. to what I can do right now. So, so uh, Michelle, in the documents that I had sent you, I'd, I'd sent you uh, the two pretests, my theory and my lab pretest. Yeah. Um, my Theory pretest is a bit different because I had made it. Um, oh wait, I, oh no, never mind, never mind. I had made it for the forty sixty three, but I had modified it. I had modified it for the forty sixty. So, so I think my theory pretest is a little bit harder than the actual theory exam, but otherwise the content is is uh, is indicative of the exam. And and also just to add to what Jessica says, please, if you get to look at these pretests and you could find better ways to do things or even to add to modify please give us feedbacks because this is going to be something that everyone's going to be using right so the better the more people could see it the better the more eyes we could have on it the better the product will be i mean of course it's already at a high standard because just guys expect exceptional but we can make things even better right for everybody else i mean thank you jessica really and uh, this this extends to everybody, please. Uh, if you if you have anything to share, also you're more than welcome to add it on the site too, or or send it to me, or if whatever, or bring it up next uh, après coup, hopefully. So, I'm gonna start saying well, thank you, uh, thank every uh, thank everybody for coming. And if you please have any question, any concerns, anything, uh, please let us know. And again, an extra special thanks to you, Jessica, and Helen, as always, <laughs> and all the CPs and teachers, you made our day. <laughs> Thank you very much for coming, and hopefully we'll see you soon. <laughs>